Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of SSI Meetup. I'm joined today by Riley Hughes, CEO and co-founder of Trinsic, and we're going to talk about SSI adoption and what that will take. Um, Riley, it is great to have you for some time, but most of our conversations are off the record, so I'm looking forward to today's chat. How are you doing? Yeah, me too. I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. Great pleasure. So uh, before we dig in, uh, as is customary, we just remind everybody uh, what SSI Meetup is all about uh, and uh, how we do things here. So um, SSI Meetup exists to empower the global communities of people working on self-sovereign and decentralized digital identity. Uh, we're open to everybody, uh, both to come on the podcast, share their ideas, uh, and also take the content that Riley and others are sharing um, and use it in your own work, distribute it to your colleagues and, and friends. Um, because everything that uh, Riley is going to share with you today um, is available under a Creative Commons by SA license, which means that as long as you give credit to Riley and to SSI Meetup, you're able to use this in your own work. Uh, so that way, we hope that we can spread the word uh, and hopefully tackle this uh, thorny problem of adoption, which Riley is going to explain to us all. So uh, with that said, Riley, why don't you uh, take it away? All right. I am happy to. <clears throat> Uh, it's it's good to be back on SSI Meetup. I think we were here about uh, almost almost four years ago um, when we were just getting street cred started. Uh, so it's it's good to be back. I um I thought it would be useful to start with a just a brief history on who I am and my experience and why I care about this problem. Uh, I started at the Sovereign Foundation, which was an early um, blockchain for identity. Uh, James. Uh, I think you might be familiar with Sovereign, uh, if, if I uh, am, am, you know, remembering things correctly. Uh, I, I was, but yeah, I started there. I, I was late. there at the launch. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. I started uh, a little after the launch, so uh, late late 2017. Um, and um, when I was there, my my job was kind of, you know, to think about adoption of Sovereign. So I was involved in the Sovereign token work, which never, you know, Sovereign didn't end up doing a token, but that we were considering how how a token might be used to drive adoption of the network. I was involved in the governance and the SSI incubator that, that Sovereign was a part of. And so I, I was involved in a lot of things that were trying to drive adoption of the Sovereign network. And eventually, I realized that the best thing that I could do for adoption of self-sovereign identity was to launch a company in the space. And so in 2019, um, I, together with uh, my two co-founders, Thomas Lov and Michael, um, we started uh, StreetCred. Uh, and uh, and we did that to build basically a way to make it easy for developers to use Sovereign. That was initially the, the, the initial scope of what we were trying to do. And about a year after that, we changed the name to Trinsic and uh, raised our first round of institutional funding. Uh, to date, we've raised almost $10 million and we've had over 1,000 different companies issue verifiable credentials through our platform. So we have kind of, you know, and 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 today we're still we're still working on this problem uh, at a high level, still trying to do the same thing um, and and doing it in little different ways and and learning from what works and and from what doesn't. Um, but we're still we're still here and still caring about this problem. And so I think um, you know the story of of Trinsic is the story of me trying to figure out in many ways how how to how SSI adoption is going to happen. I think it's worth maybe um, commenting for a moment though on what SSI is and what SSI adoption really means, because I think that that sometimes gets lost or or is assumed or different people maybe think different things about what that means. What I care about, what I want to see, the future that I want to live in is a world in which <clears throat> uh, we have a universally accepted digital ID. This is sometimes how I talk about it. It's basically, I want a digital ID that is as useful as a visa card, right? Where with a visa card, I can basically walk anywhere, walk into any any uh, establishment online or in person, you know, uh, domestically or abroad, and I can basically walk out of that establishment with, you know, something in my hand that I've I've purchased as long as I have the funds to do so. Um, it's it's practically universally accepted, and I think the the world I want to live in um, with identity is a world in which I can use my identity anywhere I want, 
uh, to get access to the stuff that I deserve or, or I'm entitled to. And um, I get on with my life, you know, now there's a little asterisk here because I also want it to be something that is like well-designed, right? Uh, something that is puts privacy at the core, something that is interoperable and, and, and allows me choice as a user. I want to be able to choose where I store my data and how I manage it and how I share it and things like that. So I also want that, but um, none of that stuff matters if if we don't get adoption, right? If, if we build the best kind of technology in the world, but nobody actually uses it, then um, what we will end up with are, uh, you know, th this problem will be solved, but it will be solved in a, di a different way using things that are not uh, self-sovereign identity. And so, you know, this, this will happen. This future of a universally accepted digital ID will happen. It is happening. These are a couple of snippets and announcements from, uh, I, I don't know, the last couple of weeks, uh, maybe mm -hmm. month, maybe a little over a month. Um, but but these these show that that companies are moving into this space, and companies are solving this problem. ID.me now has a hundred million digital wallets, uh, 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 sixty million or, or forty million of which I can't remember uh, which of those. It's um, but 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 you know tens of millions of which are at like NIST level two verified identity wallets, uh, meaning that they've done they've gone through identity proofing with a document scan, and so there are like, th this this future will happen. And, <clears throat> you know, I think a lot of people, when they look at this industry or this category, and they look at how will this occur, they look at, at players like this entering the market. And then they also look at current SSI adoption. And I think many rational people look at this and, and consider how, how will this industry play out? Well, a couple of, uh, of years ago, I put up this uh, this graph that, you know, uh, on the on the bottom axis here, there, it talks about adoption of SSI. And as adoption goes up, the value of SSI uh, increases as well, right? You can imagine having an empty wallet with nowhere to you, you know, nowhere to get real verifiable credentials and then nowhere to use them. It's not very valuable, but once adoption is widespread and I can have 50 credentials in my wallet and use them at a million different places, then obviously the value of that is very high. And so, you know, the, the adoption and value are, are, are correlated, um, but it's not a linear relationship, right? It's, it's more of a, an exponential relationship where uh, once adoption reaches a certain level, uh, value skyrockets. Um, and that, you know, I think when I first published this uh, a couple of years ago, I said, we're somewhere in this blue rectangle and I'm not sure where within the blue rectangle. And, you know, fast forward, to today, I think I might move the rectangle a little bit to the to the right, but but fundamentally, I mean, we're still in this sort of pre pre um, takeoff mode where, where we haven't, you know, SSI has not um, really. Uh, there, there are very few SSI or verifiable credential deployments that have gone mainstream or or really scaled in a meaningful way. And are you using those phrases interchangeably, Riley? So when you say SSI here, is that is that shorthand for use of verifiable credentials, or are you meaning, you know, are you meaning to impute more of the other attributes that with behind your asterisk? So the you know the the, the privacy centric user control that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm I'm not maybe being super precise with my language there. Uh, so it's good to call that out. Thank you. I think. Um, There's a lot of nuance and subjectivity, even when it comes to you know, um, one person's opinion of does this verifiable credential format give users enough privacy? Is it private enough? Is it mm -hmm. is it user controlled enough? What if it's a cloud hosted wallet? Then is it is it somehow not as self sovereign as an edge wallet or something like that? And 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 my my aim with these with with this uh, graph as well as um, what I'll talk about next here, which is this. Um, this this second screenshot on the right is uh, is not to get into the into the weeds in those conversations. And the best way that I can proxy for 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 that is by just using verifiable credentials, right? As long as you're somebody's using verifiable credentials uh, in their solution, which which presumes some level of standardization or or aim for interoperability uh, amongst applications in the future. Um, that's what I'm sort of categorizing here as as uh, SSI. Is that Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, well, it does, and, and look I, again. It, 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 uh, measured for today, I don't think it meaningfully changes where we are on the the uh, that, that x axis of adoption, right? But um, but you know, it's interesting because we do see some verifiable credentials 
uh, use cases which are very much not self sovereign that are kind of further ahead on the adoption curve. That's the only reason I, I asked the question, but yeah. 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 So I think, um, you know, the second screenshot here is of a uh, kind of database. It's it's like a Wikipedia meets Google Sheets type of a place where, where we track um, the verifiable credential adoption in the world. And um, obviously, uh, you know, it's an open resource. So uh, maybe we'll give the link and hopefully put it in a description or something like that. We've had a, a, a couple of dozen people from the community contribute to this. So if you're interested in checking it out or, or contributing things that um, you've seen out in the wild, um, feel free to do so here. And, and maybe we can, um, maybe we can get enough adoption uh, listed in this table to justify moving that, uh, that rectangle over a little bit. Um, but suffice it to say that, that, uh, you know, I really want to see identity be better in the future than it is today. I really, really care about this problem. And I've spent the last five, almost six years now in this space um, to try to do uh, just that. And I think that as an industry, we are to some degree, um, we, we risk missing our opportunity. Um, because if 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 there are problems to be solved, and if 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 SSI is not the thing solving them, then uh, other industries will, and and there we risk identity technologies being adopted that um, are less empowering for the user and more empowering for the sort of data hungry, you know, big tech or big whatever kind of uh, you know yeah. alternatives that will enter the market and fill that void. I think I'm hopeful though because we have an opportunity to fill that void. And and that's what I hope to sort of talk about uh, today. That's why I think adoption is the only thing that matters. It's sort of the elephant in the room, if you will. Um, I I really think again, if we built the most incredible technology that people didn't end up using, then we have wasted our time and we've missed uh, an important opportunity. Um, I think. Of course, I'm going to say this because adoption and, and thinking about adoption is my whole stick. It's kind of what I've been obsessed with for the last couple of years. But um, I really do think that this should be the lens through which everybody views conversations in this space, right? Is there a new, there's a new credential format? Okay, great. What is it going to do for adoption? Or or there's a there's a new product? Okay, that's that's interesting. But but how, how will it meaningfully move adoption, right? That's, I think, the lens that I'm hoping to view everything everything through. And I think, I think we could use probably 10 times as many discussions on, you know, how to, how to have products successfully adopted in the market, um, as, as we do, as we do today. So glad, glad you've had me here and hope, hope to see others on this, uh, you know, SSI meetup who with, with, you know, with, to continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We definitely have a similar mind, uh, about that, that being the, the number one issue that is, you know, you're right. It's not talked about a lot. I think some of that depends on which rooms you're in for, for, for those conversations. I mean, when we're when we're hanging out with uh, with the people creating those uh, those W three C specs, it is understandable that they're very focused on the tech. Um, but uh, you know, I think those folks too are, are really eager to get like real market feedback from actual users who are trying to do something again, rather than just debating the uh, the theoretical minutia of these things. Right. So I think I think as an industry, there is a there is a great will to to achieve what you're talking about here. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what ideas you've got. Yeah. So we have a model that I think has been helpful. And in order to introduce that model, I want to start with the verifiable credential data model, because this is what many people are familiar with. Um, I went back and looked at the SSI meetup, like the historical webinars, and some of the earliest webinars are kind of verifiable credentials 101, right? With this this these kinds of diagrams. You know, front and center, and I think um, it's helpful to start here and then walk through where we've gotten. So, I think this uh, this model, if if you take it, um, th this is the correct model for the purpose or for the scope of what the verifiable credential data model is is trying to do. It's, uh, sort of specifying a way to uh, do cryptographically signed containers of data, and and this this does that. What this doesn't do is tell you how to bring a product to market or how to, you know, get adoption of the thing or something like that. And nor is it supposed to. So I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not um, trying to um, 
uh, be too down on this. But but what I will say is that one of the reasons for that is because this doesn't uh, scale alone. This is incomplete for a sort of scalable solution. And what I mean by that is imagine you are a verifier and you want to verify something from a, I don't know, a financial institution. Well, there are like 10 or 15,000 financial institutions in the United States alone. And if you want to verify a credential from one of those, how will you know which ones to trust and which ones not to trust? Will you keep a list of 10,000 institutions and maintain it? Probably not. Um, you know, will, will every verifier do that independently? Probably not. Um, <clears throat> so, so how does that problem solve? Well, you could say, well, they just look on the verifiable data registry. See, there's that little arrow that points down to it and that, that solves it, right? And the answer is maybe. Um, but if the verifiable data registry is an open ecosystem like a blockchain or like the DNS infrastructure, then anybody in their parents' basement could you know, put an identifier up on that verifiable data registry and begin to issue any kind of credential that they want. And so having a verifiable data registry alone doesn't solve the problem. Um, the, the thing that you could add potentially to that is some governance. You could, you could lock down the VDR and you could make it so that only verified, authentic, institutions, you know, can put their identifiers on this data registry. Um, and, and, and that brings us to the next slide, which is the extension of, I think, the, the verifiable credential data model um, that is uh, published in the, the original Trust over IP white paper here, which is uh, some people call the trust diamond. Um, it, is, it is where you add a governance authority to the, the data model, basically, where in this case, a verifier can trust a governance authority instead of needing to trust the issuer, the issuer's identifier specifically. The governance authority then publishes a governance framework, which is basically a fancy word for a list of the entities, the roles, the 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 the, the capabilities associated with those roles, the rules of you know that that those actors must follow, the 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 workflows and the identity proofing they must do, and all, all the you know whatever all the things are that that those. That, that is needed to establish trust in the ecosystem, the governance authority will um, you know, enter the picture and fill that, fill that gap for the verifiers. Um, and this is a model that can scale. And that's, that's perfect because the scope of the Trust over IP uh, foundation when it was founded was something along the lines, if I, my top of my head memory uh, is serving me correctly, was something like you know, delivering internet scale or, or a reference architecture for internet scale dig digital trust, right? And this does that. But what the Trust for IP Foundation was not scoped to, to do was again, figure out adoption or, or, or strategies to get products adopted in market or, or whatever else. And so this model, while it serves the purpose for which it was originally intended, um, doesn't serve our purposes of how do we get products adopted in market necessarily. And the reason for that is that this model uh, lacks incentives. If you look at the verifiable credential data model, you see there's a three-sided three chicken and egg problem with issuers, holders, and verifiers. Um, you know, why, why would issuers sign up to do this if, if no holders have wallets? And if no holders have wallets, why would verifiers sign up to accept credentials from those wallets? And if, if there's no verifiers willing to accept credentials, then it goes all the way back to the issuers. Why would they get involved? And, and, and what we see here in this trust diamond model is that now we have a four-sided chicken and egg problem almost, right? Where there's it's sort of like verifiers aren't going to get involved until the governance authorities are getting involved. And typically the governance authorities are governments or, or some governance institutions that are extremely slow moving. They're slowest moving people on the planet, uh, rightfully so probably because they want to, you know, get things right and they don't want to um, make mistakes. So usually their whole purpose is to uh, minimize harm and risk to their, you know, constituents that they're a part of. And so it's, it's rare that you'll see those kinds of institutions um, moving fast or breaking things. And with a lack of governance authority, with a lack of uh, uh, assurance that verifiers will accept their credentials, why would issuers get involved and therefore why would holders and, 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 and on and on. And when you look at these four parties, there's no single party that has an incentive to adopt, uh, adopt in um, independently of, of, of the rest. There's nobody who has an incentive to move first, so to speak. Yeah, no, that so that that definitely makes sense. And, and just before you, you'll probably come to this, but um, do, what extent does awareness play a role here, though? Like, because I, I think I think as you're talking to this, you're assuming that uh, 
all these folks uh, have access to uh, the latest and greatest thinking in this space. They're aware that this model exists, um, but they're not able to to, to jump in. Uh, but what what percentage of the market do you think that even represents that that knows that this is possible versus um, you know versus will only ever choose the default methods because that's all they've ever heard of? Yeah, that's a great a great point. I mean, of course. <laughs> You know, there's uh, the world is very, very big. So it might seem like, you know, a thousand companies being a part of, uh, you know, who, who've, who've sort of issued a verifiable credential through Trinsic or, or, or a thousand companies that have um, attended a trust IP meeting or something like that is like a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, there are, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of, of, of institutions or companies in the world. And, uh, so, so the world is a very, very big place. And so the percentage that know about this stuff is very low. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not refuting your point because your point, in fact, in many ways, it makes your point even stronger because, you know, the fact is that the folks who do know about it are, they, they ought to be the people who would be falling over themselves to adopt it if only they could. Um, because let's face it, like this stuff was designed by people who understood a need and, and wanted a framework to, to go fill that, right? So that this first wave of companies that knows that this stuff exists are by definition the, the closest to enlightenment, uh, as it were, about yeah. about, uh, about these types of solutions. And yet, as you say, like it feels like the the incentives aren't quite there. So so it's not it's not in any way to refute the point that you're you're making. I'm just yeah. wondering if if we need to just get the numbers way up, you know, and uh yeah. and then just no, increase yeah. our chances with a bigger sample size. Yeah, you, you you remind me of I think an important point uh, that I'll I'll just make here quickly. I think that if you look at this model, I think what many um, companies have done is they think you know I want to you know we want to do self sovereign identity verifiable credentials. We want to you know how do we do that? Let's look at the VC data model. Let's look at the spec. Okay, I see issuer, holder, verifier, and verifiable data registry in the spec. So therefore, I'm going to build software for issuers, mm. software for holders, software for verifiers, and I'll build a blockchain or I'll build, you know, whatever. They'll do something in the in the in the verifiable data registry space, or maybe they'll use one if they're smart, some, some other one. But but um, but but generally, there's a you know issuer holder verifier software, right? And that's that's the the software that was built. And in fact, that's what we did when we started street cred, right? We were like, okay, well, what do we, what do we build? We need to do a company here. Well, let's, let's do this stuff. Right. Um, but I think that, um, that is the right thing as it relates to the way to cryptographically sign containers of data, but not necessarily the software that's needed to drive adoption of, of the software. And I think we've seen that over time that's played out. And like you say, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if this, this were the path, then, we would see the, the existing companies that are in the space and excited about it falling over themselves to adopt and 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 driving adoption, you know, all over the world. So, yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. So this leads to kind of the model that we use at Trinsic and the model that I wanted to share here today, which is um, where there's a, an additional party which we call a provider. Uh, a provider is the party that builds a product and packages the capabilities of verifiable data exchange into their products. Um, but ultimately it is us, uh, you know, this, this is the way that the, that every production deployment of verifiable credentials uh, has gone so far that I'm aware of. Again, I'd love to be, you know, have a more nuanced view of this if, if you're aware of other, other things that have happened. But, but as far as I know, every single production deployment of verifiable credentials has used this model. And it is basically, <clears throat> if I go one slide over and sort of just, there's a few bullet points here. Um, if, if your question is who has an incentive to pick up verifiable credentials and use them in their software right now? Well, issuers don't, you know, we, you know, we went through that, that there's nobody who independently does, but, but a provider does because a provider, which is again, just a software vendor who's selling a product. Um, they're trying to make sales. They're trying to close deals. You know, they're trying, they have a sales force, maybe they're, they're, they're paying their developers and they need to bring revenue in that will, will compensate for those developers or whatever, right? What, whatever they're doing, they, they need, they need to make sales. And so for, the, for, for the provider, um, to the extent that verifiable credentials make their product better, they will adopt them and they will put them into their product and deploy them out in the market. And, and again, I show this slide sort of 
uh, all the way at the beginning here. That is what is happening with existing software vendors and institutions out there just in the last few weeks, let alone, you know, so, so this is, uh, this is, this has played out so far. Um, they are the ones with an incentive. Second, it's important to remember that nobody adopts protocols. Nobody uses protocols. James, you don't use email, right? You use Gmail, right? I mean, unless unless you have a server in your basement running some like Linux server that, or you know, open source code to like send your emails out or something like that. Uh, yeah. Well, even if I did, I'd use the front end on top of all that, right? So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be natively interacting. So I, I I totally take your point. Yeah. Yeah. And so people adopt products. That's what people use, right? And and the only reason that Gmail supports the email protocol is because it makes the Gmail product better and stickier, right? It's because nobody would use Gmail if you were if you couldn't send a message to Outlook. And even even if you look at Apple, which is sort of notorious for their walled garden approach with iMessage, I'm sure they would love to only do iMessages for for everything, but they need to support SMS in the messenger or, or the, the messages application. Because otherwise, you wouldn't be able to te text uh, an Android phone or whatever, and they so so they they're forced to support that more open standard alongside their proprietary one, um, because it makes the product better, and people would revolt if they didn't. And you know, we could go into the minutia there, but the but the high level point is that um, people adopt products, not protocols, and mm. providers are the ones that deliver the product that issuers, verifiers, holders can adopt. And the third point yeah. is given given the current state of the market and given the current rate of adoption, um, the kind of internet scale architecture for digital trust and the, you know, whatever is some of the um some of the big vision kind of architectures are 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 an end goal or 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 maybe a a thing we're striving toward, but but there are ste incremental steps to get there. And so, um, in in our model, the provider basically compresses the roles of the verifiable data registry from this model and the governance authority from this model, and compresses the, both of those into this basically a product, uh, or 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 the provider. And the provider is the one that is basically doing the minimum required governance to get trust in the ecosystem. The provider is the one that maybe has a, a blockchain behind the scenes that they're anchoring dids and stuff too, but the issuers are are using the provider's product to 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 do that as opposed to, you know, um doing it directly themselves. Uh, and so, you know, in that way, many of the problems that VDRs and 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 governance authorities are set up to to solve, the providers do that for their ecosystems. And because it's only one party who can productize it, it's it's sort of uh, self-contained and easier to get get adopted does it uh, i mean so when you say ecosystem here uh, i mean you are you're still thinking about a plurality of, of issuers and verifiers in these scenarios ideally right so that the provider is is basically bundling up this capability and making it available to to a marketplace or are you, are you feeling like it's actually more self-contained than that it's more it's going to look and feel like an end-to-end -end product to the users but actually under the hood it's doing uh it's doing these open protocols um um i think it could could be either and i i have a slide that kind of goes into the different models that i've seen and and that i cool. suggest however i will say um, that the more self-contained you can make it initially, the the easier it is to to get up off the ground. However, if it's completely self-contained and it's only just an end-to-end -end product, the argument for using an open protocol under the hood is harder to make because if if everything is just owned and controlled by you, then why why use an open standard? And so I think there's a there's a balancing act between those two things um, that providers maybe are are, are going through. Um, um, yeah, I hope that helps. But yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. dig into that a little that makes later. Sense. Cool. <clears throat> so provider is a term that is uh, not very good, I think, not very useful. It's it's a sort of very generic term. It's like geez, provider, right? It's it's uh uh anyway. So 
we don't use that term mostly out in the world. We we use the term ID tech because an ID tech uh, product, right, is sort of a play on fintech or medtech or edtech or health tech or reg tech or whatever. Uh, but but an ID tech product is what a provider actually delivers to the market, right? So an ID tech product is just a product that helps people manage their data and identity in some context. Um, it's not necessarily SSI. It doesn't need to be SSI. It doesn't need to be verifiable credentials. It just needs to be basically a consumer identity product or, or, or an enterprise, you know, helping an enterprise manage their data or something like that. But it's sort of, um, doesn't necessarily map one-to-one -one with SSI. Uh, however, I believe possibly because I've drunk the Kool-Aid, but also possibly because I've spoken to hundreds of these companies over the last five years, that ID tech products that use SSI tech under the hood, like verifiable credentials, will have a competitive advantage relative to the ones that do not. Uh, particularly if we have, if we assume some level of interoperability or compatibility amongst those products, the collective network effect of all of the companies using the open standards will exceed that of any that you know that any one uh, company could could get a loan, um, uh, and and so, yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, not too long ago, we made a little uh, market map with just a tiny fraction of the ID tech companies we're aware of, um, but I think the the thing to note is that sometimes the name of the company is is here like uh I don't know um uh like uh merit is an id tech company that is not based on uh self sovereign identity or or an interoperable standard um but it is a an id tech company that exists that that is um, I think doing quite well <clears throat> and the name of their company is merit and the name of the product is merit uh, but if you look over here at my sudo that is a product developed by a company called Anonymy Labs. Anonymy Labs is the name of the company, but their ID tech product is called MySudo. And that's something a consumer can adopt and use uh, today. So, um, you know, there again are so many of these ID tech companies. This is just a small sampling, um, but but hopefully gives you an idea that, you know, the, uh, the ultra passes of the world, which are using verifiable credentials to solve problems in government, are right next to the ID.me's of the world, which are using not necessarily verifiable credentials to solve problems for governments. Is this making sense? Yes, indeed. Okay. So <clears throat> how will SSI prevail? How how will we win as an industry? How will we not only get adoption of uh, better sort of universally uh, accepted digital ID, but also make it so that it is private and interoperable and uh, eventually self-sovereign, universally adopted digital ID. We need lots and lots and lots of good ID tech products. That is my that is that is my strong belief at this point. We need hundreds, thousands of good ID tech products. Um, built for different kinds of people, built for different use cases and, and industries and personas uh, that solve problems out in the world. So I have uh, a few concrete recommendations for ID tech success. At this point, I maybe want to call out one thing, which is as I've spoken about this stuff over the years, I've had a lot of folks who are like, I am a provider, but I didn't know it because nobody ever told me. You know, I, like they're like, I just thought I was sort of somebody in this like nebulous kind of level four, or layer four application ecosystem world, but I didn't realize that I, I I am a provider. So if 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 you are building software that incorporates verifiable credentials, if you are uh, working with or selling to uh, issuers or verifiers or holders, my uh, 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 strong guess ninety five percent of the time is that you are likely a, a provider. And and many of these recommendations will apply to you. You, you kind so, of are by default, right, Riley? Right? Because um, because as you pointed out, so those bits are missing otherwise, right? Like the 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 existence of that uh, of that governance framework and the ability to look up trusted providers, you know, it, that that is that is conspicuously absent. So if you're selling a product that doesn't have those, it's probably not a very good product. So if you're selling a product, like you you would be you would need to be a provider. Yeah, or there's 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 these other kind of there's definitely been 
plenty of folks who say, I know what my role is. I'm an issuer because I have data and I'm an issuer and I will just sort of wait around and eventually maybe there will be verifiers that, or, or once people have wallets, I'll issue credentials into those. And, and, and then eventually there will be verifiers that pop up that'll, you know, be interested in verifying the credentials that I issue or whatever, or, or, or things like that. Um, I think though, as you say, that model, I don't think there's, um, you know, you sort of need a, a a critical mass of enough of those parties in, in all three of the areas to make that happen. And just, I just don't think ecosystems spontaneously emerge like that necessarily. They need to be no. willed into existence. They need to be driven into existence by a provider. And so, if you are, you know, many many of these issuers. In fact, if you look at a lot of these uh, these parties from just a few, you know, the, these ones, these are. In many cases, uh, issuers, right? You look at Onfido acquiring Airside, and you you wonder, you know, what is Onfido's role in that? Um, you can probably imagine that they are going to be issuing credentials into, you know, re reusable ID credentials into the Airside wallets, for example, and and, and so on. So I think, yeah, you're absolutely right that um, this is how this is how it works. If you are wanting to do something today, you basically are a provider, um, unless you're integrating in natively into somebody else's ID tech product or something, right? Um, <clears throat> all right, recommendation zero, before we even start, because it shouldn't even need to be said, but it, it, it still does, is that product execution is the most important thing, period, full stop. If you're a provider, you're building a product, you're offering a service to the to your customers, and that product or service is like, you know, that is the most important thing. That is the objective. It is building a good product is the objective. And James, you had a tremendous... Uh, webinar a few weeks ago here where you, you, know, you went through sort of how to think about this kind of stuff from a product management perspective. You know, if if you are an ID tech provider listening to this and you haven't watched, you know, James's breakdown, I I suggest you um you, you do that. But uh, but yeah, this is the this is the the first kind of table stakes point to make. And as Trinsic, we've seen interesting cases where we've seen you know ten different companies all building the same thing on Trinsic in a little different ways, different industries, different geographies, whatever. And the ones that win, there's there's nothing we can correlate with success uh, except that just product execution. Um, just did a good job at building their product and selling it, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it's really not that complicated, but it is the first uh, point to, it, well, it's not complicated to say, but it is hard to do in practice. So here are a few con concrete recommendations to for how we've seen that work well. Um, the first recommendation is to not reinvent the wheel. There are people like myself, people like you, James, people like many others uh, in our space who've been at this for some time and have learned things that work and things that don't. Um, and I highly recommend to people to um, not start from scratch and build on the wisdom of others who've been doing this a while and who've spent you know millions of dollars making mistakes that are now... Uh, uh, avoidable, uh, that, that you don't need to encounter yourself. Um, you should take this advice from me. You should also take a grain of salt along with it because I am, I am not, I'm, I'm biased here because my company is involved in helping people sort of, uh, get a jump start and, and not reinvent the wheel. And so, you know, you should do the right thing for your business. Um, but that said, uh, I have seen this work out quite well for for folks who who do it. Uh, specialization is an important part of any business endeavor, and and establishing the right, you know, understanding the the which problem are you really solving, for whom, is critical to point number zero here, which is uh, good product execution. I think so. Uh, yeah. That's the first point. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, you might have made that point less forcefully even a couple of years ago, right? Where, where the sands were shifting perhaps a bit more uh, at these at these foundational levels. And if you if if you were committed to using these protocols in your product in a in a near time frame, you would need to be conversant in how they worked and perhaps involved in the standard setting or the open source projects, things like that. Yeah, that was that was probably true in, in 2020, 2021, um, to, to some extent. Um and you know, for certain things, it, it might might be true today, but but no, I 100% I agree. I mean, there are many companies that have been uh, at this for many years now and have dealt with every possible edge case uh, around the use of these protocols and the open source frameworks and have built their own, you know, product hardened uh, 
uh, toolkits that you can use. Um, and if you if you actually have a use case that isn't just I want to issue credentials, um, then you should skip straight to that on top of their pieces, right? I mean, this is a this is absolutely singing from my uh, my song sheet here. But um, but yes. it is interesting, I think, how recently we've been able to make this point um, because it, it it wasn't you know when 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 Trinsic and Evernim for that matter were founded you know that was it was a slightly contrarian bet um, because uh, a lot of this stuff was still very much up in the air. Yeah, yeah, and going back to my point on adoption, I think every product that gets built it has an existential risk that it doesn't get adopted and like, you know, like getting your product used and, uh, you know, out there in the world. And, and, you know, that is, that is the fundamental thing that everybody should be, you know, everybody who's launching a product should be thinking about and, and optimizing for, and generally speaking, um, building on a framework that has been well-established or whatever is, is going to get you there much faster than, um, than starting from scratch. Um, mm. Okay. <clears throat> The next point is that things like user experience and messaging are important parts of product execution and frankly should be treated like R&D just like you would treat, you know, engineering or or science scientific experiments or or, or any other kind of R&D. Um they are very important and they actually matter for uh for for adoption like quite a lot. Um on the user experience side, some tactical points are that you should meet users where they are. Today, all of people's most trusted institutions and their, you know, all their most sensitive health information and, uh, you know, their their most sensitive sort of journaling and 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 uh, life savings for that matter, it's all baked, generally speaking, behind an email address and a password. It's like anchored to that right now, and as we're talking about focusing on which problem are you going to solve, um, if you set out and say, I'm going to solve problems for real estate agents and make their lives better by helping them prove that they are, they have their proper licensing or whatever. And then you also say, we're also going to solve this other problem, you know, this other problem, which is the, the, you know, the whole can of worms around, you know, uh, identity, backup and recovery, passwordless, uh, custodianship, yeah. like whatever else, like, like that, like it's, 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 it's a troublesome, uh, endeavor. And frankly, I've seen it in many cases where there are people who they're used to their like bank, bank grade security being tied to an email address and maybe a two factor SMS code. And then they use this, this product they've never heard of from the startup that's asking them to not use any of that and instead scan QR codes with for 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 data exchange. And they're like, wait, is this is this sketchy? Is this legit? Is this, you know, what you know? So so I think it is like wise in general. I mean, of course, I'm not suggesting everybody, everybody just use a password because I think there are there are better solutions than than some of the things we've had before, but um, it's also important to be pragmatic. Understand which problems are you going to solve, and uh, meet users where they are in you know with products that are adoptable today uh, that don't require onboarding into a whole new paradigm. Yeah, I mean, if you're teaching, you're losing, right? I mean, it's just the one one paradigm shift is enough for people to swallow. Like, if if you, if this is truly a delightful product that's going to revolutionize how people do their jobs, like that's enough without them having to learn a whole new way of working and all these other different uh, different hurdles along the way just to adopt your product. Yes. The next point is that focus and uh, specificity are your friends. I had a, uh, I, I, we do a podcast, as you know, James, and uh, I had uh, Manny from True, uh, who's involved in the NHS staff passport kind of work, uh, which is a production deployment of verifiable credentials and that that's done quite well. And, um, you know, the, the, he was sort of describing to me the different reactions that, that doctors would have. So, so, so the purpose was to enable a doctor to prove that they are a doctor so that they can onboard faster into a, in, into a, a different, uh, you know, location and the difference in how the doctors perceived a generic wallet app product, which used generic templates for verify verifiable credentials and connections and things like that versus how the doctors interpreted it when it's asking, oh, where was your residency done, right? Uh, uh, here are your patients, right? Here are your cases or whatever the, whatever, you know, the, the specific terminology, yeah. the specific workflows that, that only expose the things relevant for the, the, the clinicians and the workflows that they need to do to the user it just like goes a, a, a tremendously long way in terms of retention and adoption. 
Um, so I think, again, when you think about product execution, focus on specificity and to specific end users and, and specific products is, is all uh, really good. And I think while many people have an ambition to broaden the category over time, I think it's wise to start small and, and especially from a product and UX perspective, focus on an initial use case and get traction there before trying to go too big. Uh, the last point under user experience that I'll say is that um, the more steps you have, the more distance between step one and realization of value, the fewer people will make it all the way there, right? Like at every step, you're going to like lose people. And if your first step to your process is a redirect out to a third-party app store to download a separate application, that is really challenging. And I can tell you as somebody who, you know, has spent lots of money building a wallet app and, you know, who's, who's, who's lived this and who's seen it happen dozens and dozens of times where people build a mobile app for their use case. Uh, it, it is a challenging first step where you will see great drop off. Now that said, I have definitely seen mobile apps succeeding. So I'm not, I don't want to say that like a mobile app is a terrible idea. Nobody should do it. Um, but what I want to say is that um, you should probably have a good reason for doing that. You should probably think through that from a product perspective. It should not be the default, uh, you know, just, just because, uh, just because edge wallet equals SSI or something like that. It should, it should be a, you know, a, a, a means to delivering a better product experience, which is the end goal, um, or, or should be your end goal. And, uh, again, e even, even once, you know, taking aside the initial onboarding, um, all the steps in between of you know how do you how do you verify a credential how many clicks does it take a user to walk through the journey you know uh you know how many qr codes do you need to scan to like interact with a new entity right things like that are all areas where where um drop off will occur and from an adoption perspective uh are areas to optimize to like uh, improve your odds of success mm. and are, are our customers heeding that advice Riley, because you know, a lot of times people people think of a wallet when they think of SSI, right? And a lot of these people driving these projects, like that's that's kind of what they've imagined that they're going to ship. Um, and so, are you finding that you have to let them down a bit and say that, like, actually, you can start with a custodial wallet and just log in with username, and password, or with your existing uh, any connect thing, or whatever? Or, or actually, um, when people realize the effect that will have on adoption, are they are they quite happy to go forward that way? I think there's two categories. If people already have a product in market and they're considering how verifiable credentials could be added to their product, uh, they're usually quite excited to know that. Um, and, and I'm only speaking from the intrinsic perspective and, and our product offering. I, I think there are other players out there who have different kinds of product offerings who may have different perspective. And there's always some, some degree of uh, self-selection into mm. the kind of place you want to go. You know what I mean? Um, but in our case, people are very excited to know they can embed a, 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 a you know a wallet into their existing IDP under their existing IDP and and get basically a, a verifiable credential wallet for free into their product without having to force other downloads. I think yeah when they're when they're building a brand new product from scratch, that is where people tend to, as you say, they imagine they're going to ship a, a mobile app or a wallet or something like that, and and those are the cases where I think there's some. Um, uh, uh, you know, ad advising and conversation and like, you know, questions like, well, why is that? What will that give you? Yep. You know, et cetera, kind of things. And and again, it's not all, the, the answer is not always avoid a mobile app. The the answer is just, or the, the, you know, the point here is just think hard about the product experience you're putting your users through and whether they will, whether it's worth yeah. it for them to like go through that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, The next point on messaging, I think, the first point is just to avoid jargon and be specific. If you're telling your users something about zero knowledge proofs, it's probably not, uh, and I'm talking end users, right? It's probably the likelihood that, um, I mean, if, if you are one of these in the uh, ID tech market map, if you're one of these in the web three box here, where all of your users know what a zero knowledge proof is already, and they're excited by that because it's a sexy sounding phrase, then like, go for it. But if you're, if you're trying to teach yeah, people yeah. about like carry key management or, 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 or the newest kind of zero knowledge proof or something like that, um, that is, 
uh, you know, I would, I would, uh, encourage you to be specific about what benefit, what problem is this solving for the user, not what technologies are you using to solve it for them. Um, it's, it's like, you know, when you go to a restaurant, you may want to know at a very high level, the sort of, uh, couple of the ingredients that are at play, just so you can have a sense of what, how, how to, how to anchor this dish in your mind and whether or not you want it. But ultimately you care about the, the food experience, not each of the ingredients in the food. And then the next point that I'll make here is just something that I found helpful that, that may be helpful to others. Um, it's just a really snappy way to describe an ID tech product. Uh, it's just a framework where you say this ID tech product enables blank to use their blank to do something. So, so in the uh, staff passport case uh, for doctors, it enables doctors to use their employment status to onboard faster into the next hospital, right? Uh, Farmer Connect is a is a is a partner of ours at Trinsic. They enable farmers to use their history with the supply chain to get credit that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten. So this is a very like, sort of one sentence way to describe many of these uh, SSI products that I think would be um, sometimes take a while for people to sort of articulate it yeah. otherwise. Well, or or any product, right? I mean, this is this is back to back to my favorite point of just like it's your point zero. Like it's basic product management. Like actually, if you, if you can't sketch your really simple user story for like at a high level, what is this thing for? Then you know there's a risk you may not be solving a real problem, and you, you you're actually just trying to shoehorn SSI into something where it doesn't fit. So, yeah, agree. Okay, and then my last uh, point here is to, again, spend the research and development cycles on uh, thinking through the business model and the business, the, the way that you're going to set up your um, your product. Because if you don't have a sustainable business model, it's probably not going to last very long anyway. Um, these are a handful of things, and I think we're going to flush this out further. And I plan to put a like a blog post out that flushes this out in more detail. Um, but just as a teaser, I think. Um, uh, James, as you sort of asked a bit earlier about the ecosystem type, uh, where, you know, is this like a, a contained end to end product versus is this, a, an ecosystem with multiple parties, et cetera. I think you can make that distinction there. You can make a distinction on who pays, who in the ecosystem is the payer of the service. Um, and then I have a couple of, I have some terms that I use to describe the, the combo of payer plus ecosystem type, and then some examples of where that's been done in, in products in, you know, so far in the ecosystem. So you can, you can look at this table. I think the, uh, that the yellow highlighted row is generally the one that people think is like the golden, the golden scenario where you've got uh, a new ID tech product where there are independent issuers and verifiers that are adopting the product separately. And you have holders in the middle who are exchanging data between these parties and both the issuers and the verifiers are paying the provider for that privilege. You know, that, that is like a golden scenario that some people have been able to pull off. I have Zada on here because they, they've done a really great job of that in, in Southeast Asia. They're, they're doing really well. Um, uh, but that's not, that, that's not the only way that this stuff can work. There are other kinds of ecosystems and other business models that, um, that, you know, that, that, that I think are, are perfectly valid as well that you can, um, uh, you know, that I encourage people to, I guess I'll, I'll put out a, a, a blog post on this uh, before too long and can continue the dialogue there because this, this is probably deserves its own, its whole own webinar. Uh, on, yeah, on I was going to say there's, there's a lot, there's a lot here. Um, but of course, cause I, I know some of these examples, I can, I can infer some of, uh, some of what you're meaning there and the, you know, d perhaps I'm stealing from your next blog post so you don't have to ask this, but like, do you have a, do you have a proposal for which of these might be uh, might be stronger, or is it is at the moment is this more just a survey? Hey, I've seen all these things; they can all work given the right uh, given the right ingredients. Because um, those last two feel like they might be like the bootstrap ones; they might be hypothetical, as in like it would be it's a credible proposal. But like, are we seeing Equifax do this today? I don't know. Like, uh, not 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 yet, but they certainly could, right? Um, right. I think that, um, I think the, 
curated ecosystems, meaning the there is a provider that is bringing together separate issuers and verifiers and holders into a into a an e a curated ecosystem. Um, that one's harder to do. Mm. Uh, that's the hardest one because you've got to get both issuers and verifiers on board. Uh, but it is it is more it's uh, generally I think stickier and uh, you know more there's more it's harder therefore there's less people doing it and also therefore there's more value potentially created there. So I think it is a that that is like an exciting category. Although the chicken and egg problem is a challenge for folks doing that. I think down at the um, the the next ecosystem type being self-contained. Those are areas where, like in the member pass case, that is a, a credit union issuing a credential to a user that then the same credit union will then verify back. Um, in general, obviously there are cases where those work, um, but in general, I, I tend to find that the value proposition is not quite as acute or the pain point is not quite as acute. And the the, the fit for verifiable credentials is not quite as ideal as, as maybe some of the other ones. Um, yeah. And on the bootstrapped case, I think this is where you know, uh, um, you know, we're basically seeing ID tech providers. Uh, I think I think specifically on the proxy issuance side, the very bottom row, where maybe instead of going and onboarding the issuers directly, you are using an API to sort of get the data, ingest the data into the wallet, and then once you've got the data in the wallet, uh, maybe maybe you as the provider are are the one that's cryptographically signing that data. Um, you know, then then you can work with the verifiers, get them get them on board before you go work with the issuers. I think that that is a model that I think I'm seeing most commonly today. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm advising lots of people to to consider that as well because I think you know, as you say, it is hard to herd the cats for your whole ecosystem together. Um, but actually, if existing business models and APIs exist for some of these pieces, then you can you can step in and, and fill the gap there. And then yeah, once the flywheel's going. You've actually, to your point about incentives, there now exists an incentive for the issuer to consider um, natively becoming a part of that ecosystem rather than being proxied in by by you as the provider. So, yeah, I've definitely seen that one in the wild, and I and I think it it is probably one of the ways that we'll achieve scale. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, I want to close just by saying that I, I think that the parallels that exist today where with where identity is and where we're at with SSI um, is really uh, quite striking with, with where finance was 15 years ago. I think if you rewind 15 years ago, there was the sort of great financial crisis, the, the meltdown of the financial systems, which basically brought to people's awareness that like even these institutions that, that they thought that they could trust are, uh, you know, Maybe maybe they can't trust it quite as much. And then sort of right yeah. before the financial crisis, you have some early fintech winners. You have you know the the PayPal's of the world. You have the the Finicities and the the Mints and Intuits, and you have a few fintech winners. Then you have the financial crisis where it it kind of throws everything up in the air as it relates to finance. And then after that, you get fintech infrastructure providers that enabled this explosion of fintech applications. And now. 20% of unicorn companies are fintechs. There are fintechs for every possible thing you could imagine. And then the long tail of like, like the amount of consumer choice now, if you just take traditional fintech infrastructure and if you, you know, w w you know, with the knowledge that like crypto and DeFi and all this stuff is like another spinoff from this event uh, that's related to finance. But but if you just take the traditional fintech infrastructure, like, like it's been an un unbelievable explosion of Things that are happening in that in that world. Now, if you look yeah. at identity, I think we have uh, again big institutions uh, that people thought they could trust with their data uh, uh, mis mis misstepping in terms of the consumer trust, um, and you have uh, COVID, which is another kind of big. Uh, some big big crisis that threw threw everybody's you know threw everything up into the air and accelerated uh, digital credentials in a lot of different industries and and had to prove them out in the wild you know in in different ways and so I think just like we have sort of pre COVID a few big like identity winners right we um, uh, we talked about some of these players in the in the ID tech uh, market map right air, the airsides and IDMEs and merits of the world for example um, then you have Kind of all this stuff happening, which is 
cause people to now have more question marks around their data and then post this. Now we have companies like like the one that I'm a part of and 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 others providing ID tech infrastructure that are enabling hundreds of these ID tech products to explode. And I think that the, the opportunity is right now. And if we miss this opportunity, I, I don't know, you know, I think we'll end up with a little different, the, the, the world will play out a little differently. It'll play out with more uh, proprietary, uh, more siloed things and, and less consumer choice and, and freedom. I think, I think though that the, the tides are shifting toward portable identity um, in a way that is really compelling. Um, but that requires maybe some of us to break the ideological conventions or the idealistic conventions that we want to hold around self-sovereign identity and, and and make us be a little bit more pragmatic about what will really get adoption uh, today. And so that is, you know, I think the stakes are high and I really want to see this happen and see it work. And so that's why I'm, you know, glad you had me here to talk through some of my, you know, thoughts on this um, because I think the, the time is now. So let's get building, I guess, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, clearly, clearly, the need for a mindset shift is is a big part of your message. And you know, I, I, with with the people who are trying to take these products to market, you know, helping them be as successful as possible is is, is obviously an important thing to do. You know, what in, you know, in in your position as as a as a, a platform vendor, someone selling to these these providers, like what is there anything you can do from a from a product perspective, um, or or do you really feel like a lot of it is about awareness and education um, because because of where you've sort of drawn that that product perimeter. Um, when you say product perspective, do you mean from our product, which is an infrastructure, yeah. or do you mean from an application layer perspective? Well, I mean, you know, you there's only so much power you have to tell your customers how they should be building their product, right? Um, but you yeah. can make some of that self-explanatory by by what the product you offer is and yes. by how you go to market yes. with it so so i'm wondering you know obviously today we've, we've been doing the education and kind of evangelism piece but i'm wondering if there's anything you can share about about those other pieces where you might be helping to to move the market more directly yes um i think there's two things uh and and i didn't bring my uh sales pitch slides so uh forgive me <laughs> if this is just uh off, off the top of my head but you know the, the one thing that we're doing i think is um this idea of um, appless wallets or or zero kind of kind of zero friction onboarding into wallets. I think you see this really mm -hmm. strongly in the Web three space with wallet as a service products uh, and mm -hmm. with um, uh, yeah wallet as a service or embedded wallet products. Uh, that that is kind of our um, more recent approach. We we made sort of a pivot in in November of last year um, toward this direction where it is uh, you know zero friction signups to wallets where the first time a user gets into their wallet, it's because there is already a credential in it and they have an opportunity to yeah. use it as opposed to the user needs to go out, download an app, onboard in the app, scan six QR codes, like to go through this yeah. whole yeah. process yeah. before they can even get started getting value. I mean, that that is that is how we operate now. And so you can, you can again, put a wallet behind your existing IDP so that as a user, they can just authenticate directly in there. You can tie factors to that wallet uh, from the user so that the mm -hmm. user is still in control and from a kind of a, a keys and, and control of the wallet perspective and, 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 you know, the, 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 we're, we're, we're retaining some of the, uh, you know, as much of the, uh, idealism as we possibly can, because we are all idealists, um, uh, while optimizing for products that can be adopted today. So that, that's the first one is the, the wallet, the kind of novel wallet architecture that we brought into this, uh, in, into the product. And then yeah. the other element of it is what we call adoption tools, which is where, we are building some reusable components um, and uh, features that um, providers may normally want to build on their own, but but we can sort of, in, instead of uh, everybody building them separately individually, we can sort of build that and deliver it into the ecosystem uh, that way. So for example, the ability to, to take a a verifiable presentation from a credential and package it into uh, uh, Apple or Google wallet format. Mm -hmm. Right. And and mm -hmm. still allow the user to manage the selective disclosure associated with that, which is which is, I think, uh, kind of cool. Another one is um, the OpenID Connect uh, or the, the, the OpenID for verifiable presentation flow um, and, and yeah. some other 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 components that we have that are white labelable to the provider's branding. Right. Those types of things that we can kind of deliver out yeah. of the box that help providers um, with some of those uh, 
rubber meets the road mm-hmm. kind of uh, adoption or integration challenges. Yeah, that no, makes sense. Um, and, you know, I, I liked your comment about how, uh, you know, how, how users that adopt protocols, they, they adopt products. Um, but, you know, if you, if you think back, you know, 20 plus years, you know, it was as cell phones were, were first being brought to market to the mass market, at least, um, you know, in, in the U S you had, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty open innovation, a few different rival, um, standards for how the, how the airways can use the protocols were used on the, on the, the networks themselves. Um, in the, in the EU, they said, uh, if you want to use the spectrum, you have to use GSM. Um, and the government basically mandated a a common protocol um, that would guarantee interoperability, um, and that was that was kind of interesting because uh, it created a huge market. And obviously, Europe is not is not the same as the US, um, but uh, you know the the success of vendors, you know, not just like you know Nokia and, and Motorola and others who were who were very very big in Europe, but that that whole pace of innovation, you know, we had. We had mobile payments so we could text people and other networks and things like that here in Europe when in the US that was still a that was still a fantasy um because the, the government had stepped in and mandated that um and so I'm wondering if you know the EU with their uh, IDAS 2 regulation might be poised to do the same thing again and we'll end up with the equivalent of the tiny great phones with amazing battery life that can do all things um here in Europe because um, by sort of flattening the market at a protocol level, um, we will create an attractive enough um, opportunity for for to lean, lean in on. Um, a, do you think that's do you think that's a possibility from your vantage point? And and B, more broadly, do you think there are other things that the government could do to help with this uh, adoption problem? Um. Yes, I mean, I kind of two comments. So on the on the. Um, the kind of European approach, I think there's two things to be aware of. The first is that while that is all ongoing, I don't think we'll see anything in production for the next couple of years, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, this, is a, this is a process that they go through and rightfully so. And it, so I think like um, as as companies in this space, anybody building in this space can't wait around for that to happen and, and needs to move forward, you know, sooner than later. Um, if you're a, a large company, you know, like a, like a, like a, like a gen or like a Microsoft or like a whomever, I think, you know, that is a little different story. Um, uh, the second thing is that, um, I don't know how this happened with the mobile carriers necessarily, but what you risk is the risk of premature standardization. I think like it's a little different when you're talking about something like the EU mandating Apple uh, add like USB-C ports or something like that. USB-C is tried and true, and there are probably a billion, you know, like, I don't know, 10 billion, 100 billion USB-C ports, you know, out there in the wild right now uh, yeah. Yeah. in production. But but when you're talking about something like verifiable credentials, there is a risk of prematurely standardizing the wrong protocol or, or a standard that maybe isn't, um, I mean, to some degree, you know, when we talk about standardization, there's an element like it's important because interoperability is one of the key value propositions of of what we're all doing here. But mm-hmm. there's also this element of like we need to build a good product, and it's possible that the that that particular form factor of JSON LD, for example, or that particular form factor of selective disclosure, for example, or pick your thing, isn't the right one that will get adopted or or that will lead to good products or or, or good developer yeah. experiences or whatever, and so. You know, I would be pretty cautious to um, like like what I would do if I were a government um, is that I would I would mandate the things I actually want. I would mandate some level of interoperability, or I would mandate some level of uh, maybe selective disclosure, or the ability to prove uh, something without you know whatever whatever my requirements were, I, or or the, my privacy guarantees that I that I need to have. I would I would I would specify those, but I wouldn't specify or name a specific thing. Like I saw one RFP yeah. that specific specifically said it needs to use the Aries framework JavaScript in this thing. And I'm like, <laughs> that very specific. It's not yeah. only a specific <laughs> standard, but yeah. it's a specific implementation of that specific standard. Implementation. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is just yeah. not 
what I would recommend, particularly because you could take the Aries framework JavaScript and you could like add a, a different standard into it if you wanted to and like yeah. write it into the framework. And like that is, a, so it's, it's, a, it's a totally silly way to think about like doing RFPs or, or mandating things. And so what I would mandate are the requirements um, and, and what I would sort of, yeah, as a government try to force adoption of are, are the, the, the standards that we want, not the, um, or sorry, the, the, uh, the outcomes we want, not the standards that will get us yes. there. Um, and, and I would let the market yeah. dictate which of those standards will best address those requirements. Mm. Yeah, no, I, th I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. And we, we'd have to get uh, Andy Tobin on here or someone who's, who's been closer to that work to, to explain the specifics of it. But my, my understanding is that's more or less what they're doing. Um, they're saying kind of what it needs to look like rather than precisely what it needs to be. Um, and the other thing they're doing, of course, is is requiring uh, the member states to step forward as issuers um, and actually issue uh, you know, government backed ID credentials. And I think that's kind of got an interesting catalytic effect, perhaps. Um, but but you're right. This is, you know, it's exciting, but it's going to be years in the making. And and so if if our if our main question is how do we beat the lesser solutions to market, then then this may not be mega relevant. Um, and there might be other things we could do that are that are more impactful. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Um, yeah. I think the other solutions, cool. okay. I think the, the key takeaway is that they are rushing and to onboard relying parties and verifiers at breakneck pace. And they are focusing on the business model and the adoption first. And I think their perspective is they can always add one of these standards in later if they, if they, Feel like they need to you know what i mean like but but what they can't do later is make up for lost market share and i think that that is uh i think sometimes in the ssi space we maybe have put the cart before the horse a little bit in terms of the order of operations or or, or the prioritization of, of these things because you know like i say if we if we build the most incredible privacy preserving tech and then nobody uses it and instead they use this uh, surveillance thing because it beat us to market then uh that that really is like um by focusing so much on the thing we want, we actually missed the thing we want. You know what I mean? So yeah, 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 yeah. No sh shame on us if we let that happen. I I totally agree. Um, awesome. Well, gosh, we've uh, we've burned through what like an hour and ten minutes <laughs> chat chatting away here. This has been uh, it's been a great conversation, Riley. But uh, we probably better wrap it up. Um, it's been it's been really really good to hear your perspectives and and look for the folks uh, for the folks watching this or. Or listening to us um you know i think i think this is an incredibly important point um it is it is fascinating to discuss the new innovations on the technology side uh, to get vendors to come on and talk about their their products and the uh, new whiz bang features and all that kind of stuff um but you know it's it's the difference we make out there in the real world um that's what's that's what's most exciting to me personally um and i think i think your point riley about how we have a potentially limited window here um, in order to, to make a difference and prove that any of this is, is worthwhile um, before solutions which are just good enough uh, steal the march. Um, and so uh, I think it's a it's a very timely rallying cry. So, uh, so I thank you for giving us that. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, All James, right. for having me. I think if I could just say I really enjoy talking with people. If, if there's anything I've said that people disagree with or want to add a little layer of nuance to or, or whatever um, or, or agree with, I encourage everybody to reach out to me on on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, uh, you can search my name, you'll probably find me. Uh, we also have a podcast called the Future of Identity Podcast, where I talk to people who have gotten some level of adoption of verifiable credentials out in the wild and talk about the lessons learned and you know, um, you know, the the tangible product takeaways, hopefully, from those experiences. So those may be two other things that I would recommend people check out if this was an enjoyable conversation for you. Sounds great. Cool. Well, thanks again, Riley. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, I look forward to our next chance to chat. But uh, in the meantime, take care.